the one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let's see what I did here. Okay. So hi, I hope everybody is doing well. Um, hope you had a good week. And when we were here last, not sure if I, Bonte, did I, um, did I talk to them here or just in, in on Sunday before? On Sunday, on Sunday you spoke on to Sunday. them. Okay, so let's see if I can get out of here. Okay. Well, the, the good part of this week is I don't look like a chipmunk anymore. <laughs> I actually looked like a chipmunk with my cheeks all full and wondered who that was if I, if I passed a mirror, <laughs> you know, because I had um, dental work done and it was really, really swollen on this side, you know, and I wondered who is that creature in the mirror? <laughs> So anyway, what I was talking to them about on Sunday was that I think I want to draw from several different things for March and talk about something that we don't always easily talk about, which is aging. And basically, a lot of people have called and, and said, that we we found out or they heard that Bonte uh, Bonte Vimala Ramsey was stepping back from teaching, and I'm not sure exactly how it was put, but the impression was that he was ill, and we got a lot of get well quick cards, and that's very good, but it isn't that he was ill in that way as much as that he is aging at 75 he is beginning to age and he is having some uh some difficulties with reality and basically he, he what happened was as near as we can figure out i went to visit for about nine or ten days and saw him in the mornings saw him in the afternoon and saw him in the evening and watching his um, it, the difference in his face and the difference in his communication each time basically it appears what's happened is that he's had a set of little strokes and that he's having trouble afterwards with reality and I've worked with aging before uh, over the years, worked in a home as, and he also did. He had experience with this too. And what happens sometimes when a person has little strokes and things like this, which is what we suspect is happening. And the reason there is suspect and not verification is because he doesn't want to go to a doctor and it's an interesting development in the laws surrounding the protection of the elderly in our country, because this situation is kind of unique. Here we have somebody who has had something happen and needs to go to a doctor to find out if there is a biological base for what happened and can there be any help in that way. But if the person doesn't want to go and he's not a threat to himself or others by being incoherent in that way, then that basically means we can't do anything. It's sticky. <laughs> it's very sticky uh, because what happened, and I think that the students really need to understand, it's not exactly a get well quick card because it isn't the flu or a cold. It's a little bit more than that. And as deterioration happens when aging, 
being put in a position where you have to deal with two realities is very difficult and frustrating, especially if you see the other reality as being real. So it's difficult for us to communicate in a conversation and know if he's thinking on this one or is he thinking in this one. It's like two dimensions that are meeting, but going like this. They're, they're not hooked together. They're sort of floating and they're going like this. His, his alter reality is not a bad one. And the reason he thinks that it is so real for himself is that he had almost, when he talks about it, the initial time he talked about it, um, he basically believed that this was like this, it's like an experience we would have of opening of the mind, but this is an opening, not just into the operation of your mind to see clearer, but an operation, but an experience where he has a set reality where he sees he has a job to do for the next eight or 10 years. And basically when I describe it, you can't say, well, it's, it's uh, horrible or frightening or this kind of thing, because actually it's a reflection that's coming from when I believe it's a reflection coming from when he was younger and wanting to basically feed the world and have people be happy and help people everywhere be able to have enough food and clothing and housing. And that's what he appears to believe this is his job now to try to do that, but he's not sure how to do it. So one of the things that came up that initially was interesting, but then got disturbing for him was asking us to uh, manifest things that he needed to have this happen. In other words, coming to you, coming to Sarah and saying, now, Sarah, I need you to manifest a hundred million dollars so we can have it in the bank uh, by Monday and we can send it to um, our organizations that help people and such as the Shriners organizations or children of the world or this sort of thing. And we can put this money in there so we can make this get rolling and, and happen. And I think the frustrating thing is when, when we can't do that uh, and you know, manifestation for advanced meditators, we can get to, seems like a lot of us can get to a level where I, I, I can manifest Sarah and she comes in the door five minutes after I think about her and she's in London say, and all of a sudden she's here and I didn't know she was coming, you know, and it's kind of fun that this can happen pretty regularly instead of once in a while. And you can say, well, things like that happen. Well, okay. It's kind of fun. It didn't do it on purpose. Just came up in my mind in a morning and started thinking about it. And then within 10 minutes or 20 minutes, the person appears or the phone rings or someone's at the door. It's just amazing. But that's not material things. And this is material. When it comes to material things, like I need apple juice, not water, and I need it right now, even as simple as that, we can't make that happen yet. <laughs> so, whether we will be able to in the future or not is interesting. Depends on how much we get out of the way and allow those things to develop. But he believes that we should be able to do that now. And, and this is what's happened. And if we don't, he gets very agitated and upset and very frustrated that we're not cooperating. So this is hard for the people who are at the center um, two or three people are there trying to, you know, who are there all the time. There's, I believe, four people involved to help him to, to, to operate better. But the problem is talking about these things when he's teaching, uh, he can't stay on track anymore because this is floating. The two realities are floating like this and just keep going like that, you see? So this is what we're dealing with. And Many people have written us uh, to offer help and suggestions, but what we read 
in those letters, David tells me is basically um, that probably people think that there's a doctor involved and that's the issue. If we could help him get into a car and go somewhere. So many things have been tried, trust me, many things we sat down, thought about different things while I was there and we took the route of attempting to get, uh, you know, medical people to come and try to get him to go to the hospital, but nothing works. And then legally he's protected because if he says no, we can't make him come out and get in the car and go. So it's a very, it's a trap situation. We have to just help him as much as possible. Is he eating? Yes, he's eating. Is he able to um, basically take care of himself? Yes, he is. And yes, he's very much there in that respect. And we think that maybe he's beginning to see there's something not quite right at this time. But when you visit him in even a day's time, you can see that um, his face changes from morning, noon, and night, morning, noon, and night. So getting up and staying awake is um, difficult for him to get through a day with the same energy. And he's not, I don't think he's moving around enough. So that's basically his situation. And we basically announced uh, about a week ago, he won't be teaching now. He retired, stepped back from teaching. This is a similar thing that happened with Ajahn Chah. It's a similar thing that happened with uh, Buddha Dasa. Similar things at, at the end of, of falling into something that's like this and crisscrossing, thinking the reality is one thing. But I think what I see most when I was there, people have asked me, so I'm basically just letting you know that it seems that the reality, the extra reality, is a reality to me that reflects the things he wanted to have, all of us wanted to have happen in the 60s and 70s before the millennium happened. That we believed that human beings were developing things fast enough that they could do what it is he talks about by basically having government step back, get out of the way and take care of the people. It sounds a wonderful idea, <laughs> you know, rather than having the governments appear to be playing games and you're sitting there wondering, how is this gonna affect me? And um, their games come first before anything else. And that's what's, you know, really sad about the world and human beings is that we have the potential to fix things, but we decide, it isn't that, our, can you do it? No, I can't. Actually, you can, but you're not going to because of other things. So it's one of the things about the greed, hatred, and delusion cycle that cycles around and, and goes on in history. And that's where we are. So I thought it would be interesting to spend March for some time to take a look at some of the things that happen when you're faced with someone who is very close to you and the teacher is a very close thing for us and uh, look at what happens when we want to understand what was the buddha saying about this about living and and about dying and as part of the lifeline being born and then living and then facing the end of the line and what sort of things was he actually talking about this i i got on a um um sort of a kick a while back of did he really teach us certain things about this sort of thing so we know we went to suit number 143 and we heard anatha pindica i went back and brought this out to you all and 143 that in the Advice to Anatha Pinnika, what happened was basically he laid out and it got preserved as an example of what the monks would do if they came to your house and were teaching you as you were dying. So as a person was leaving, does the teaching help us to know what precisely to do? And so we went to 143. And what we found out was he did leave that. This was preserved. And when we're looking at 143, 
we're looking at our urging ourselves to pay attention to cease cessation and have a, uh, a full and complete understanding of a clear mind as much as possible, exactly how a person leaves. When a person comes into the world, if you see a baby and you watch the development of a baby, the baby's eagerly at different stages wanting to see, identify, name everything as they learn speech and communication. And they're building and storing everything up here. The problem for us when we go uh, to the point where we're going to leave or move on is we're full. That is the whole problem. We are full. And so with our heads so full, like an encyclopedia, packed encyclopedia, it's kind of difficult to just lay there and understand about pain if we haven't been taught or understand how we can leave and uh, move on if, if we are faced with this body and we have no knowledge about it. So the Buddha has given us a tremendous amount of knowledge about what we're supposed to do if we are leaving. And so when he talks to us about this in Anathapindaka, uh, the plate you go to section, um, I think it's um, <clears throat> after Anathapindaka describes to Sariputta his condition. And he has a lot of painful feelings in his body and everything. What he does then is Sariputta jumps in and says, then householder, you should train thus. And the whole teaching in the sutta in 143 revolves from section five. It's on page, page 1110, if you have the book. The whole thing begins by saying, I will not cling to the eye and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. So right at the beginning, we begin to see that the Buddha is looking at leaving. The first thing that's going to happen is the cessation of the use of the six sense doors. And then there's a continual, after you go through the six sense doors, in this case, you should train thus, I will not cling to the eye, I'm sorry, I will not cling to the ear. He goes through the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, and the body, and will not cling to these parts, okay? And my consciousness will not be dependent on the, on the, on the uh, operation of these six, five sense doors on the outside, or even the mind thinking, thinking, thinking. So Sariputta is trying to put the person in a position where they're just watching this experience. And most of us in most cultures, I think the thing that lines up with death pretty immediately on the surface is fear and not having any preparation for leaving, not having any preparation for moving on. Without any preparation, then there is the space for the sphere to come up and it's just unknown and what is there. If we haven't developed uh, the letting go and seeing things impersonally and just watching. So this one starts with the six sense doors and then it goes to um, clinging. That's the internal sense door, the actual sense door. When it says internal and external in the text, it means the internal actual ear, for instance. And then the sound that hits the ear is the external. So it, it, the first section is, this, is the six doors. Second, on uh, section six is basically clinging to the forms, the sound.
Hello, Sister Kema? I think it has uh, frozen. Something has happened. I'll just call her and check.
she is coming. Uh, the internet problem is there, so she is coming. Please wait uh, for a, a minute or two. She is trying to uh, log in back. Okay, so I guess I'll leave these bright lights on, I guess. <laughs> Do you want me to turn them off or are they okay? I think it is okay for me at least. Okay, we'll leave them on. Looks like I'm getting ready to float up. <laughs> okay, anyway, okay, so here we go. Um, so we got to section six and this one is basically, I'm explaining to you the six the six sense doors and the, the sense doors, internal and external, always means the internal is the door, the external is the impingement. In other words, this one is impinging the ear, the sound. Okay. And then the, um, the next piece is the sense door consciousness. So the link in dependent origination, backed by ignorance formations and consciousness is just a pool of consciousness and you draw from the only way consciousness can actually cognize anything is if it passes through the sense door gate it's part of it so you then get eye consciousness ear consciousness nose consciousness tongue consciousness body consciousness and mind consciousness so no matter what it is it keeps repeating in the sutta that I will not cling and hold on to this. So he's showing you a process to use in order to move on. You will not hold on to this, and that's why you want to stay, is what this is about. You understand that it's a process to be born and to live and to die and move on the body dying and the consciousness just moves on. Okay, and then the eighth part of this, the eighth section eight is I will not cling to the contact as it happens or to the feeling that is born of it in section nine. So it took you through the sense door, the sense door object, the sense door consciousness. Then it took you those three pieces made contact. And then it says the feeling arises. Okay. Then it switches and it goes to the elements in section 10. In section 10, it says, I will not cling to the earth elements. I will not cling to having to feel and touch the material, um, the material form in the earth element. Okay. Or I will not cling uh, to the water element or cling to the fire element or the air element. And the elements are easy to remember because the earth element is the solidity or firm part, hard and soft. And the water element is the basically um, sort of hot or cold water, you know, and you want to have a funny experience, you fill a bucket with water and hang your hand in the bucket and about the water. All you can actually do, you can't hold it as a earth full element, you see. All you can actually do is feel that it's hot or cold. Then the fire, you can feel the heat and the air, you can feel the air moving, okay? And it basically is a lesson of not clinging to the consciousness element um, of these things, these four, these uh, four basic elements, the consciousness will not be dependent on the consciousness element either, or space, these six elements. Buddha was interesting because he's teaching the traditional um, four elements, but then he's, his whole teaching turns out to be about the body and uh, and mind and in the from the the world 
remember I told you that Ananda once talked to the Buddha and said, Lord, where is the world? And the Buddha replies, Ananda, the world exists between the top of your head and the soles of your feet. That's it. The whole entire world exists there. And we can go deeper, deeper into the teaching until we see the full, complete meaning of this when he says that. And so the uh, next piece in section 11, I will not cling to the material form or cling to the feeling or the perception or the um, formations or consciousness. So there you're looking at the um, body, feeling, perception, um, forms or consciousness. And this is your five aggregates he's going over and saying, I, I will not be dependent. My consciousness will not be dependent on, on the consciousness or any piece of any part, any one of the aggregates. So I'm not going to get caught in desire of staying there for that reason. And then you trained us, the householder, I will not cling to the base of infinite space or to infinite consciousness or to nothingness or neither perception or non-perception. And so this was one of the things during the time when the Buddha was passing away that it is talked about in the Parinibbana Sutta passing through and coming back to the fourth jhana and then we, and then moving on at that point with full complete balance and equanimity in the mind, no disturbance in the mind. So all of this, when you look at this, if you were to not know anything about this, could be pretty frightening. But if you're looking at it as another investigation, another experience to go through as part of life, it can get interesting. In the case of, um, you know, in Athapindika, if you go in section four and it's talking to you about how he was feeling precisely in the body, he had a lot of pain, which was increasing and not subsiding. And he knew he was getting, uh, not getting well, and he was not comfortable and he had burning in his body and a fever that made him feel so hot. He was like being roasted over a pit of hot coals, he says, and, and pain in his belly. This is not always how death goes. You know, sometimes if the body is in good shape and just reaches an age where it's tired and the mind wants to go on, okay, which is more or less the situation here that we're talking about. Um, there, a lot of this is not there to deal with, but in Anapapindika's case, by giving him the exercise of precisely how a person is, can be observing during the process of dying, he was giving him the gift of not placing his attention, not allowing his attention to be pulled over to all the things that are described in section four. Because why? Because those pains and those processes that are going on, their hindrances, their, their um, disturbances and distractions and pulling you back and forth this way. And if you don't understand the principle behind nutriment for the distractions, and if you haven't, you don't remember this law of the distractions, which is basically if you pay attention to it, and sit with, say, the arising of a pain and stay with it until it's there, until it's gone away, then it's going to be very painful, very, very painful. But at that all time. Or, or our, what is it called? Degenerating arthritis, degenerative arthritis, where there's tremendous pain in the bones and the bones, the knuckles and the, in the hands, for instance, are just all swollen up and out of shape because of the uh, fever in the hands and the pain in the hands. But the pain in your body always has a cycle. This is interesting. 
Mayo, uh, the Mayo Pain Clinic, you know, they have studied the process of pain and the lines of pain and how they arise. They're there and they pass away. And they all have, they're not there. They rise up and they are there and they pa always pass away. They're in cycles. So if you learn whatever cycle is happening as you're laying there in the process of this going on, and you realize that this cycle, you can identify it, then you know it's going to keep going like that, like this, and like that, and like that. Again, arising, it's there, and down again. And this is, this is what um, you can watch, and you don't necessarily have to pay attention to it. Notice that it's happening. The moment is, oh, look, there it is again. And it's part of me and it's part of the whole body when it's going on. This is true in an accident too. If you have a uh, car accident or if in my case, if you have a tree fall on you and you're pinned to the ground, if you remember this, when it's going on, you can watch it and be, it's something to do rather than being terrified of what's happening. And, and having a serious reaction that doesn't help you or anybody who is trying to help you or comfort you or take or to rescue you, you can get your mind wrapped around what it is you need to do to, uh, to save yourself in an emergency. If you can understand that pain operates this way. So that's part of this too. Now, then what happens next is he, after he goes through the different levels in the um, in the jhanas, the the path, and you drift through those, then you can go back and forth, and then you can answer the door. Can you hold on just a second? I'll be right back. So this is the process, and we're going right now. You can sit here if you like. You pull a chair in here. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So you've gotten up to the point where you're moving through the levels with your mind, okay? And you pass through each one that we've learned in our practice, okay? And, and then what's happening, as I said, you can move back and forth between them, but the most balancing point you have is the fourth jhana, which is the same thing as the Buddha actually did, okay? When he was passing away, he was basically leaving from the fourth jhana. So he went past it through infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception or non-perception. And then he moved back to the fourth jhana, which was the most balancing point. Okay. And then from there, he passes on. Okay. Then in section 13, he even goes to the point of after you're going through your whole body and deciding what to do, which is what he was teaching in Athapindika, then what's happening is he's saying, I will not cling to the world and my consciousness will not be dependent on the world. I will not cling to the world beyond and my consciousness will not be dependent on the world beyond. So he's even covering this and he's saying, you don't lay there and just start thinking about this direction or that direction. You allow the process to happen. So this is a leaving and it's a gentle leaving and it's a taught leaving. It's not something that was left out. Many people have asked, um, did he actually teach us? He taught us about life, but did he actually teach us about the, the dying of the body at the end, what to do so that we're not terrorized by it. The unfortunate thing is in some, in some um, cultures, there's still, you can find an, an um, anthropologically, you can still find cultures today, which are, that's totally included in the cultural line of life, birth, and the process of living and then dying, okay? So to move on, this is what the Buddha is basically saying with a clear mind, with full complete understanding and not upset by this process, understanding it's time to move on, okay? 
And the last part, he says, I will not cling to what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought after, examined by the mind, and my consciousness will not be dependent on that. This is how you should train. Notice all of those are very personal, aren't they? So all of them is, I, I remember I have seen this. I remember I heard this. I sensed this. I understood this. I encountered this. So don't drift. You stay open to the experience and just watching the whole experience. And then with when this was said, the householder, um, Anathapindika, wept to share and he says, no, I'm not, I'm not foundering. Um, I have long awaited upon, waited upon the teacher and the monks worthy of esteem. And never before have I heard such a talk on a stama as this. And then there's a remark in here that we note that it said that the talk on the Dhamma is not given, this talk on the Dhamma householder is not given to the lay people clothed in white. Such a talk is only given to those who have gone forth. And this is not correct. This is one of the little mixed up spots. Historically, if we go back and we look through everything, we find, well, certainly it was taught and there was a group of people listening. But um, this, is, since this is pointing to only the monks were taught this way, and that's not exactly correct, okay? So that note, you know, is something that's contested and, and discussed a lot. And then he says, um, also remember I, what I told you about Anathapindika. We have to always remember who he was and what he was doing. So if you are a musician or someone who has been doing concerts, this is the best example I can give you, okay? Anatha Pindika was the, the manager in charge of the roadies. So what's a roadie? What am I talking about? In the concerts, big concerts all over the world, when we set up a concert, a group of people go ahead of the performers and the entertainers. They're just, you know, when it comes to building a concert, we're not very important, but when we set up the concert, all of the wires, everything laid out. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a roadie here who does roadie work for a big temple here in, in, uh, in Mumbai. And these roadies are running around the whole time while 10,000 people are here. And they've made sure that the rug is there and the chairs are there and the lights are there and the stage is there and the wires are there and nobody's going to get electrocuted and everything's gonna work on the microphone and the speakers. This is the roadie, and this is who Anatha Pindika was. And so, uh, and you know, the thing is, he was there when the Buddha was giving talks all his life when serving the Buddha, but was he totally listening? No, not exactly, because people were coming to say, what do we do now? There's not enough water for 500 people. What are we going to do now? There's not enough uh, plates for these people or stuff like that. And he had to take care of all the assignments for the people taking care of uh, who was coming to the Buddha where, when he was uh, giving talks and things like that. He was a very busy person, and he missed some of the points of the teaching. We don't find a lot of other suttas where he's talking about what, what actually the Buddha was talking about. So this is something that we find in, in the text here, okay? And then um, when we talk about, uh, I think the point I wanted to make with all of you was what was happening for Bhante right now. And, and the point is he's not in bed, he's not facing this right now but he certainly understands the teaching that was around the concept of this, the end of the line in the lifeline is not just part of being born and that's it, that the lifeline, the whole life continuum line is composed of three parts. It's composed of being born into it and looking at what 
the human being goes through in the beginning of uh, their life in learning everything, that tremendous period of the baby and the infant coming up through the toddler and learning everything really fast. And then living life and absolutely completely filling up your brain with everything you've experienced. And if you don't learn the teaching in the, uh, the Buddha left us about the past and the future and the present time, then you're carrying an awfully big load in your car. Like I tell you, the little car is, you know, this little car is going along uh, the lifeline and just moving along all the time. If you are carrying what's in the past in your mind and then you're worrying constantly about that, okay, well, then this is going to rock and it's, you're going to have a breakdown at some point. This is how a person has a breakdown. They're carrying everything that went happened back here in the trunk of the car and then the car is tipping like this and falls off for a period of time and the person has to get back on track and empty this out learn how to forgive it and dump it out and clean it out and then they can go forward again and they need to not let the the, the future no matter how much it's hanging over us keep us from experiencing the present time and <coughs> excuse me Bonte is trying very hard to experience the present time and he's doing fine you see the only difficult part for us is that we can't uh, it, it sort of would scare people if we were just teaching and putting a, every allowing him to teach and then putting things up right now because he'd be talking to you about could you please manifest a uh, hundred million dollars by Monday so that we can give it away to save the children fund and feed the people all over the world and house the people over the world. I have worked with elder people in, in uh, a rest home and in uh, nursing homes before. And so has Bonte. It was something we could talk about easily because we had both done it for more than a year's time at one point in our life. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting to have the feeling of the elder around you all the time and be working with them patiently and, you know, helping them with what they need to have happen and um, balancing. We only had a small place of 17 or 20 people, 20 on the maximum. And it's just very interesting to see them live out the end part of their life and how sharp some of them are, how lost some of them are, but they're lost only to themselves, to them, uh, to us, lost to us, whether he's quite happy and glowing in the face and with beautiful eyes sitting there talking to you about what he has to do for the next eight or 10 years. The disconcerting thing is when he'll say something like, so I have cleaned my whole entire cootie out, given everything I have away to people, and I'm ready for this new job that I have. Not retirement, but I, this new job will be from eight to 10 years. I figure I'll be going out. And first I'll have to make sure in the new world has food and housing and clothing and is, is in a good situation. Then after I've done the earth, I can do other planets and other universes. And that's what I'll be doing. But uh, so I might not be here the end of April. I might not be here the, in January of 2023. He doesn't understand, have a feeling of what that actually means. So he's not He's not a person who is suicidal, I can tell you that for sure. He's not, he's still smiling and sitting there and telling you about this universe. If you're quiet and you don't object to the universe, you can get many, many deal in details about this universe. But of course, the universe isn't real. It's like another, another part of his consciousness going back and forth like this, like I said. And it's, it's hard to, you know, help, know how to help him unless he can go to a doctor, unless he can find out what, whether there's a biological reason for this. So I'm going to stop. And if you have questions, I want you to ask questions. I'm happy to answer. 
And um, next time, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Stephen Levine's book about when a person does just, uh, reach a point where their end of their life continuum line is happening, okay, then what happens? I mean, um, is that it? But basically, who dies is the question on Levine's book. I don't know if you can see this or not. It's not very good light. Mm, it's coming in and out. Okay. Um, this Levine book, it seems like you read it backwards. Wait a minute, I can fix that. I think no, not able to see. We are not able to see. Well, let's see. I'll fix it. Just a second. No, we are not able to see. What is the title of the book? Now, wait a minute. Okay, I can turn it around. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Turn it around so you can see because there's a trick here. I learned about this. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if mm -hmm. I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Here. Switch off the uh, uh, blur. Uh huh. Okay, now look at it. Can you see it now? Whoops. No, uh, your camera is off. There it is. See it? The camera, camera is off. Huh? Go, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. Wait. Okay. There. Can you see it? It's Stephen, Stephen, and Andrea. Levine and the book is Who Dies. Yeah, and it's a really good book. It's, um, I will tell you it's Christian based, but as far as the whole process, you just slip in what's Buddhist or what's whatever you are into it the whole also, thing. Because it also has a kind of uh, the, uh, the Indian uh, kind of Hindu background also. Uh, oh, it has. That's uh, well. So that's that's floating in there also. But it's we were just talking this week about religions and and the religions and the commonality. And I think last time I was reading uh, to you, and I will bring this up again. Go back to Buddha Das's book. That's the other thing. We go back to Buddha Das's book is Christianity and Buddhism. He wrote a really good book. Wait a minute. We're having the same problem there. Whoops. Wait a minute. There, can you see it? Christianity and Buddhism. And this one is from Buddha Dasa, Buddha Dasa Buk Bhikkhu. He's a Thai monk. His basic, he spent his whole life trying to balance, bring balance back into Buddhism and have the monks basically stop. People need to just stop slamming each other from religion to religion. It's something that just needs to stop. And he, he was showing, uh, you know, when you look at religion, how the core of all religions is basically for you to be happier, feel more secure, and to help your community be balanced and things like that, you see? Okay, but it has this thing about the competition people get into, and I just go back to my dog's bigger than your dog, and, you know, my dog's bigger than yours. <laughs> You know, and mine's, mine's bigger and everything. Okay, so that's that's basically what was happening. All right, so I just want to open this for questions for about five minutes or so and, and uh, 10 minutes and just see if you have any questions about what we've been talking about. Okay, so let me go back to you. Okay, so does anybody have any questions at this time? Sarah, I've never heard you be quiet. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I don't really have a question. I'm so sorry. Um, I suppose I've been reflecting or as you've been talking a few things just how important the practice is the the the, the constant process of the letting go the releasing and the relaxing and the not holding on and it's always struck me that there's this um meeting point that the letting go enables us to live and the letting go prepares us to die and that it's, it's the same. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
And I, I, I was also reflecting as you talked, it's just what my mind put together about how you're describing um, where Banta's mind is in, in terms of uh, the real need to help people and um, the, the, the vulnerability of, of lack of home and lack of stability. And it's, it's obviously very uppermost in, in our minds in, in the West, you know, we've got 41 million people on our doorstep in a situation of horrendous war, migration in Europe of an unprecedented scale in my lifetime. And I understand what you're saying. It's, it's we don't know where this, this has come from, but it's on the same timeline of something that's very tragic that's playing out in, in real time. And, um, and we don't know where that's going to end. So there's a, there's a synchronicity, if you like, between something you're describing <laughs> and something that's playing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. So there's and not think, so much a question, but a, a kind of mm -hmm. a connection that I made. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, there's this time. This uh, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. I don't know if you heard that song from the '60s, but that was a big song. Um, to everything, turn, turn, turn. And there's to everything, turn, turn, turn. And there's this, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a time to be born, a time to live, a time to die. And it goes through all the pieces of it. It's an old, old, an old song now. And um, I think that's what we, we face when we face it with a teacher who all of a sudden, you know, something happens and then we can't, uh, we can't go for guidance as much as we could before we can't we can't hear him fresh as he was before uh, we have a lot of films on, and, and, and in a way we're fortunate because we have people who want to teach but in another way we're unfortunate because we have only taught them to play his films and then try to teach what it means and so they haven't practiced while he was still alone Alive very much and he is alive here but he hasn't when he was totally sharp they haven't been practicing the way i've been put in a position to actually teach the texts to you okay that's only because i was with him for the last 20 years you know, see and um but most of them have not had that opportunity and so they do the very best they can and our teachers are are beginning to realize that they need to be using the same terminology, not dressing it for you and for me and for Everett and for Sarma in a different way, in different terms of terminologies. The trick to the six R's and the trick, it's not a trick, but the, the way that it works is a, a very, uh, and I'm not being rigid, overly rigid when I explain this to you because I spent a lot of time looking at it, is it has to be done in the order that it's done. It can't be turned around and changed. I just recently saw someone uh, change uh, Anicca Dukkha Anatta as a good example. When I realized what was happening with the instructions being changed here, there, and here, there, and I'll do it and say it my way and out of my heart this way. And, and then the results just fade away. They're just not there anymore as, as pr pronounced as they were. Um, there is a practice that gets developed, but there is not the results happening anymore. So I'm not being overly rigid by saying that when I went back into the system of the Buddha, the 37, the groups that are in the 37 requisites of enlightenment and the different parts of it that you've heard us teach you about, that each one of those needs to stay exactly as they were written in the texts too, you see. So just take something as simple as Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. Now, write down on a piece of paper that it would seem better, if, easier for you to remember if I put this in alphabetical order. So when I write about it and I teach about it, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Anatta Anicca Dukkha instead of Anicca Dukkha Anatta. Now, I want you to, to just consider this, what happens when you just do it with those three, 
There's also the five faculties. There's also the seven enlightenment factors. There's also the eightfold path. We can go on and on with these groups that we, we learn about Buddhism. But let's say you want to do to have your personal style. So you start to twist it around a little bit here and there. You see? What happens within Nietzsche, Dukkha, Anatta? It's very clear. A Nietzsche was change, which caused Dukkha, which is suffering, and Anatta was the escape. You see that? If we turn it around and say the escape is first, and then we'll talk about how everything changes, we, and then we talk about suffering. Now, what have we got to teach if we're taking you to listen to Bhante teach the text or us teach the text. We would just put it, we took the boat basically and we sank it <laughs> like a canoe that flipped over, you know? And, and I, I'm shocked at when I went through looking at all these groups, does it really matter? The person said to me, and I said, well, go. And I wrote him back about a week later and I said, Go ahead, take all these groups and flip them around and see what you can teach somebody and tell me, tell me if it's still going to work. Yes, okay. So, um, so that's thing to look at, you know, how we are doing it and how we, if change to our teachers need to be using the stack terminology and I'm not being pushy about this, but then well, everybody's students could get help from any of the teachers. You see, that's what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking about. So this is, this is a tricky little thing, but yeah, the continuity is everything and looking at how this works smoothly and that he gave us a complete teaching. So I'm going to ask all of you to keep Bonte in your prayers and to be sending him metta and sending him encouragement to, to uh, you know, your energy during the weeks to come and, and help him to uh, figure out what's happening. We think he's getting more stable now. We think he's eating better. He's getting, you know, so he's little almost willing to say maybe something's really wrong here i should see a doctor we're we're hoping he's going to come down from this and and settle down a little to saying let's go find out why this happened but we're not sure where it's going because when you have a stroke things change for how you see and how you reason everything so we have to keep going this way. It doesn't affect us much in, in Asia, the way that we are set up and developing here, where everything will continue to teach. And there are retreats coming for uh, the summer and for the fall. So things, and there are going to be more online retreats. Okay. So I will let you guys go. Anybody else have a question? You can tell me and write me an email. Okay. Can you do that? <laughs> okay so let's close out with a prayer okay may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be may the grieving shed all grief and may all beating beings find relief may all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness may beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I will see you next time.